Um, well, his patron, Augustus Caesar, who was um, in fact an autocrat of Rome, uh, though he considered himself as the savior of the Roman Republic, right? Um, uh, Livy's project was after Augustus's heart. That is, Augustus asked him and Virgil and others to uh, try to do things in arts and letters that would restore the old Roman virtues because he thought, and I think he was largely correct about this, that um, certain kinds of vices that rich people are prone to had gotten into the upper classes in the city itself. Um, and uh, uh, they included they included the sexual vices. Um, the, the, for instance, Augustus passed a law that required men of a certain age to get married by then, right, and not not to remain unmarried, not to remain like, like free radicals in the state, getting getting uh, girls pregnant and otherwise not being responsible fathers mm -hmm. of families. Um, anyhow, uh, so uh, uh, so Livy writing his history of the Roman people, which I think also was a task that he, he loved, uh, he genuinely wanted to do this, is writing in part as a moralist. So he, he, he wants to show uh, not simply what happened, but what we can learn morally from what happened. And it's not that the Romans of old were always virtuous, they weren't. Mm -hmm. And Livy doesn't cast them as always virtuous, but he does. Uh, it is a kind of moral drama in that the old-fashioned virtues, if we follow them, um, really do lead to success, mm -hmm. uh, prosperity, victory in war, and order in in the state. So, what are exactly the old old Roman well, virtues? The the quintessential virtue for the Romans was pietas. Yeah which is now translated into English as piety. But uh, as I told my students this morning, when we think of piety, um, an image comes to mind of your grandma uh, lighting a votive candle at the side of the sanctuary and saying Hail Mary. Um, it's something that very nice grandmas do. Uh, it doesn't seem in our minds to have to do with your duty to your country or your duty to God or your duty to your father, to the, your parents. Um, but in the Roman mind, in the Roman mind, um, all of those things went together, right? So the virtue of piety meant that you did your religious duty. You didn't have to love the gods. Nobody loved the gods. Why would you love the gods? But you did your religious duty by the great gods. And then your patria, which is your fatherland, your country, and your family, which is governed by the pater familias, the father in charge of the family, right? And to your household gods. Mm -hmm. And the household gods were your ancestors, uh, deceased. And after their, uh, after their death, they become gods of your household and you honor them. They, you, you make little figurines of them or you have death masks made of them, and um, from those masks you can get uh, uh, maybe a sculptor to sculpt the bust, or you can, um, you can cast something in wax and have it on your mantle uh, for special days, for holy days, so that Uncle Vinny will be there, and Uncle Vito, and all these others. And they, they, um, they remind you of where you came from, and they exert a kind of powerful conservative influence upon you. You have to measure up to your forefathers. And they're still there with you. They're watching you. Um, they're beneath your hearth. Uh, they're centered upon the good of this household as you should be. Um, it's a powerful virtue. And I think it's a natural virtue. It's one that the Christians saw. And um, they said to themselves, well, yes, they've named the virtue correctly, but they don't have the right God. Okay? They've gotten some things wrong about how this virtue applies to, to us in life. But the virtue itself, um, the virtue itself was uh, a, a powerful natural good. Are uh, Livy and Virgil in agreement with their understanding of Pietas? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, one of the things that in, it, it requires that uh, 
we would find uncomfortable is a subordination of your individual desires to the welfare of your family and the welfare of your country. Not to mention your duty to the gods, okay? When it comes to any kind of uh, conflict between these things, if a conflict should arise, it's not that you put your individual desires second. Your individual desires don't get put at all. They are of no consequence. What's important is your duty to the gods and your country, your city, and your family, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's what's important, and the, the household gods. You don't enter into it. You take what you should desire from the requirements of the virtue and not the other way around. And that means sometimes, as we'll see, as we see in Virgil's Aeneid, that means sometimes that you're not going to have a happy life. Right? Aeneas, Virgil's hero, does not have a happy life. He can't have a happy life. Um, if, he, if he pursued his own delight, he would be doing none of the things that he has to do in the poem. But you have to do what you have to do, and that's all there is to it.